it's the first time I've given this talk. Um, it's about a theory of functional programming that I've been developing. As you know, I teach functional programming and I have a blog about functional programming. So people ask me all the time, um, what is functional programming and why should I use functional programming? And I've not had a good answer to this question. And so I'm like constantly trying to come up with like, what, is it, what does it even mean? So um, these are the two questions that just keep popping up. What, it, uh, what is it and why? And of course, I've read a million definitions and I put approximately 10 in here. <laughs> so this is John Hughes, you know, no small fry in the, in the functional programming world. Fun he doesn't actually define it, but he kind of talks about it in a de defining kind of way. It's functional programming is so-called because its fundamental operation is the application of functions to arguments. And then he talks about how you can write a program that's just one function made out of other functions. And it's just, you know, whatever arguments you pass in on the command line, and it'll just output the result. <laughs> Um, here's another one I found online. Um, if you Google what is functional programming, you get a million of these. Process of building software by composing pure functions, avoiding shared state, mutable data, and side effects. Um, declarative rather than imperative, that happens, people talk about that a lot. Um, and application state flows through pure functions. So this, this is just not what I do when I do functional programming. Like I do some of this, but there's a whole, I don't just avoid shared state. Like there is shared state, there is mutable data, there are side effects. Um, and um, this whole declarative versus imperative thing, I don't want to go into it that much, but even Haskell is, an, is imperative. Like it's not declarative. Um, it has a well-defined like evaluation semantics that you're just expressing when you have your syntax. Okay, uh, functional programming is about writing pure functions, about removing hidden inputs and outputs as far as we can. So that's a good one because he's saying that it's not just only pure, um, but it just describes the relationship between inputs and outputs as much as possible, right? So you have this, um, kind of qualification. So it's that's kind of better, but I still don't like that it's all focused on this pure functions thing. Um, all right, this is Wikipedia. It's got the same kind of thing. Evaluation of mathematical functions, avoids changing state and mutable data. It says declarative programming. Wikipedia is always true. Okay. Um, functional program is a way of writing software application using only pure functions and immutable values. It's just not true, right? It's just not true. Um, all right, now this one is where you, you start to see some that kind of seem very arrogant. Like, there's no other definition that's correct unless it's equivalent to this one. <laughs> there's no other definition that matters. Oh, Even the, I'm going to put that at the, at the end of every, like, pure <laughs> exactly. There's no other definition <laughs> <laughs> functional programming is programming with functions. I mean, it's just like, whatever. You know, JavaScript has functions. Okay, you're using a function, it's pro functional programming. Well, some of them happen to be. Some of them happen to be. Okay. So, I've gone to the drawing board and I started looking up words in the dictionary because you can't find a good definition. Now, we all know that Functional programming is a paradigm. So what is a paradigm? So I looked up two definitions. I'm not going to read them, but I'll just pull out, some, you can read them, but I'm going to pull out some things that I liked about these definitions. Philosophical or theoretical framework. It's not a list of features or, you know, it's not like functions or pure functions or no state or anything like that. It's a, it's a theoretical framework for how you approach your problem. Um, it's about theories, laws, and generalizations. What can we say about programs when we have a, a coherent theory around it? 
It's about your basic assumptions, your ways of thinking, your methodology. So these, again, these are the two things that I'm trying to answer that keep coming up. What is it and then why use it? So my goals. I want to explain what it is that we actually do, not just, like when I see these definitions, to me they seem more pedagogical. They're trying to, to compare functional programming to object-oriented programming, for instance. And so object-oriented programming has mutable state, but in functional programming we don't like that, so like it doesn't have mutable state at all. Like it's, it's a good way to maybe show the difference but not really a way to define it. It doesn't help us move forward. Um, I also want to talk about or explain, I want the definition, the theory, to explain why it does have some advantages over other paradigms. Yeah. Um, and I want to avoid focusing on the features. It's not like, um, you know, you need a, a certain list of things that you're, you're, I mean, there might be a certain minimum thing, but it's not like, uh, you know, my, my language has monads, so it's functional, something like that. All right, so let's get into my theory. And please, I would love this to be a discussion. So if I say anything that sparks a response in you, just shout out and I will promptly ignore you. <laughs> uh, so let's go. All right, so my theory is that as a paradigm, functional programming breaks down the sort of the, the chess pieces that you've got in play when you're, um, when you're programming into three things. Effects, data, and calculations. And we'll go over these now. All right, so effects. So this is a dictionary definition, a change that is a result or consequence of an action or other cause. So at this point, this is like why we're running software. We want it to have effects. We want to be able to click a button and it changes something about the world. Um, but notice it's about causality. It's bound up in time. Causes happen after, no, ha causes happen before the effects. Some, I've been watching a lot of time travel movies. Um, causes precede effects, right? So anything that you do in this sphere of effects has to do with time. It depends on when you cause the effect. Now, I've been thinking a lot about this. I think effect is the wrong word. But this is the common word that we use in programming, effects or side effects, something like that. I think it should be the cause. It's like I'm causing a message to be sent. The thing I manipulate in my program is the cause. The effect is the message actually going down the wire, right? So anyway. Um, because we're, we're doing the causing. Okay, so here are some examples of effects. Sending a message, writing to the file system, because if you're writing to the file system, other programs can see that change, right? If you had some kind of protected disk that only your program could read and write to, like maybe you could say it's not, it's not an effect. Um, but because other things can read and write while you're doing that, we call it an effect. Um, and then, of course, having mutable state. So you could have state that's shared between different threads and you would, you know, reading it depends on when you read it, like what the value is. So it's all about that time and causality. Okay, so next, data. Factual information used as a basis for reasoning, discussion, or calculation. It's a really nice definition. Um, one thing about data is it's inert. Like it doesn't do anything on its own, um, but it's serializable, you hope, um, but in general it is. Uh, and it requires interpretation. It doesn't have any, it can't run on its own. Uh, and there's some numbers there, or some examples there. That's pretty easy. Okay, now calculations. I'm calling them calculations and not functions because functions are too much feature oriented um, and it, it excludes languages like Java that don't have functions. They have, you know, they have methods, but
but if you wanted to, you know, if we said you have to have functions, then we would have to say you cannot do functional programming in Java, and that's not true. Okay, so the thing about calculations is they are eternal, meaning whenever you run them, you get the same thing. Um, they're, they're outside of time. Their definition exists outside of time and space. Um, and you could think of them as they're like you have input data and output data. Um, and they're referentially transparent in general, which means you can replace the answer with the expression that calculates the, um, the so thing. Middle both like a functional relationship. Yeah, it, it's, it is a uh, data to data transformation. That's what I'm trying to say. What do you? That stands out to me as the most functional thing support. Um, so are you disagreeing that we use data in functional programming? No. Okay. But like, okay. Because other paradigms use data? Is that, I don't, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I would like to address what you're saying, I just don't. Yeah, it's 20 out the arrow. <laughs> the arrow? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the arrow. <laughs> Right. Okay. Okay. Maybe yeah. instead of calculations, transformations. Yeah. Maybe. Um, right. And then also one thing I wanted to like a lot of calculations aren't actually functions in functional languages. Um, so, for instance, um, an if statement, right, or an if expression. It's not a function. It could be like it, but it's not. It's usually not implemented that way. But it is a calculation. All right. So I want to, I want to like, I, I hope that at this point everything seems like so obvious. Like, why am I even talking about it? But I want to contrast that with object oriented programming and its paradigm and how it's like a totally different way of seeing the world. In object oriented programming, you have objects and they have an inside and out and outside. The inside is the implementation details that you're trying to encapsulate. And then the outside is the interface. And these are the things that you talk about in object-oriented programming. You don't talk about data and transformations and effects. You just talk about passing messages between objects. And that's it. That's all that is there in the paradigm. So I feel like this is novel. Like I don't hear people talking about, talking about stuff this way. Now they might talk about it indirectly, like they might say, oh, we try to avoid effects. So then effects obviously is an important feature that because you're trying to avoid it, you're even naming it. Whereas there's no, you don't even name it in object-oriented program. Okay. So here's just a couple of example ways that functional programming is implemented in, in a couple languages. So in Haskell, you have data, and so there's a bunch of data types that are built in, and you can define your own types. Mm -hmm. Calculations are functions, and then there's a special type called IO that's for effects. Okay, so you can see that um, it's pretty, pretty clearly delineated in Haskell, and the type system helps you keep everything straight. Now in Clojure, it has its built-in types, and you can have the collections and everything, build it up. And we use functions for both calculations and effects. Yeah? Uh, does, does, it, does it throw a resume thing in anything when we use functions as data? Or is that oh, that's coming up. Okay. That's coming up. Okay. That's coming right. up. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So maybe you're ahead of me. Maybe I should go faster. <laughs> so, um, right, calculations and effects can be data. And I think that, so, so what you're saying is you have first class calculations and first class effects. So both Clojure and Haskell have these as first class. Um, and then you have language like JavaScript that has them as first class too. First, you know, it has first class functions. Um, and, you know, functions in JavaScript are used for both calculations and effects. What is a first class effect? First class effect is you have the effect as a 
as a thing that you can represent in the language. What's that? Right. Exactly. So the effect would be like an impure function. Yeah, like in Clojure or JavaScript, yeah. But in Haskell, it would be a value of the I.O. type. So some value that you've built up using probably monads. And then you can compose it with other stuff with more monad stuff. Yeah, that's how Haskell does it. Is they have a, a, t a, a type that represents the effect. It seems, yeah. Because again, if, if we replace the more common words, first class functions, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First class effects just strikes me as functions that see sense a message that's not a so, so like if you like you in JavaScript, if you have um, a function that when you run it will send an AJAX, you know, request. That's a first class effect. Okay. So you can pass it around. So you can pass it around. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, when you reframe it as causes instead of effects, it makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. I think it's. A, so should I call it causes? Yeah. I know, you can't rename it now. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. It has an effect when you actually like execute it. I'm. And you, it's storing the effect to sound like storing the Yeah, that's right. Right. It's not like storing physics. Right. 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 But maybe I should. I mean. I should put it in parentheses or something. Uh, okay, and so then, quotes, effect. Um, so then there's the, the other side is that because we, we're using universal Turing languages, um, we can actually represent any calculation as data, right? So you can, as data. So you could encode some kind of language as a data structure and have an interpreter for that. And so then that data might represent some kind of calculation. And the same for effects, right? You can just encode them however you want. Um, and so then we have this thing where like everything's basically interchangeable. Like you could, data is functions, or data is effects, data is calculations, calculations is data. And I would, I would argue that if you don't have this, you're not, you can't do functional programming. So if you don't have first class calculations in some way, like not all calculations have to be first class, but you have to be able to make a, make a Turing complete first class thing with, you know, so like in JavaScript, plus is not a function. It's an operator, it's built in. But you can always wrap it up in a function, right? So that's OK. That's what I'm trying to say. You can do, you can do functional programming in JavaScript because you've got this first class. And you can encode stuff in JSON even though it would be really ugly. All right, so here's the thing. With those definitions, it's, it's all well and good, except it hasn't really proven anything like it hasn't proven that by drawing lines like that, you're actually subdividing anything, you know? Like, what if something's like data and a calculation, like it's, hap you know, on one side or the other? Um, but just intuitively, we can see that we can take two pieces of data and put them together using a calculation and make a new piece of data. So we can stay in that data realm. We can take data and put it together and make new data. You can add numbers, or you can concatenate lists, or whatever you're doing. It stays in the data realm. So it means something to be data. Like, you can stay data, right? And then it means something to be a calculation. You can take two calculations, two, let's say two functions, and compose them. And you still have another function. It's still a calculation. 
Um, and so there's different ways to compose functions, right? You can do like a sequential composition where, you, you know, you, like the, what's classically called function composition. F dot G is uh, calling G on X and then F on, on the answer of that. Or you can do like a parallel thing. I just made up a symbol here, but you're, you're returning, you're calculating both and returning the tuple of the two, right? Not, not saying one happens before the other. Um, and then there's other stuff like map and filter and stuff like that, that are also ways of making a function out of another function. And then effects. So if you have effects and you make two, one effect happen and then the answer, the result of that effect gets passed to the next effect, that's a sequential composition, it's still another effect. And you can do the same with parallel, just start both of them and get both answers back or whatever. So you can see like these spheres make sense, like you can stay in one sphere. And I, I hope intuitively that makes sense. I, it, it seems to me like this is like one of the most important ideas that data doesn't just become a calculation. It, 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 it makes sense to call that data. Okay, but so now we're getting into why and what's the point of this and dividing it this way. Effects are contagious. If you compose a calculation with an effect, you get a new effect. You don't get a calculation. You have something pure and you mix it with something impure, your thing is impure. And so you want to avoid that as much as possible. You want to like quarantine your impure things so that your pure stuff can stay pure. Um, but notice the opposite isn't true. If you do a partial evaluation of a function with some data, it's still a function, right? It's still a calculation. And you can take two calculations and put them in a list and it's still data, right? It hasn't changed. It, they're, still they're still pure. Uh, okay, so some examples of this calculation and effect gives another effect. You could say, I want to print the square of a number. So you square the number and then print it, right? That means like, and then. And then you could do the opposite order. You could read something and then parse it. Now the square is a calculation. The parse is a calculation. But these things, because they have a, a bang at the end, are effects or causes. And um, so this whole thing together is an effect and this is an effect. I think it would be interesting to dive into a little bit why effect, contagious effects are bad. Mm -hmm. I think if you come from functional programming, you it's know, yeah, obvious. right. But, if, if but besides you, the contagion, if you want all of your objects to do something, <laughs> if you want all of your objects to cause something to happen, it doesn't make any feel like why would I want to stop my objects from doing something because they're contagious? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little right. Bit yeah. Right. It's a, no. It's a good point. It's a good point. Define the contagion, but not the symptoms. Yes. Right. What are the symptoms of this disease? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's a little bit out of. Okay, <laughs> no, it's true. And, and and do you have any insights into what I should say? Mm. You might just have to um, give examples of what things are, like a calculation and a side effect. Like a calculation is. Right. Right. And that you can't call that twice without changing the world twice. Right. Right. Would you say that affects room in your timeline that you were going to about beforehand? Sure. You can set a quantum effect on triggers. That because it's like it's like watching a bad uh, or a good, I'm probably a good uh, time travel movie, where you're like, this is this is messed up. Like the timeline is, I don't understand it anymore. If we could just keep it pure and functional. You need to functional programming time travel movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to explain first class also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. People that don't that's true. You do a good job of explaining first principles. Yeah. Okay. 
Cool. All right. So about calculations. So now I, I, I feel like the theory has been established, like we can start talking about corollaries, like what does this entail? Um, so one thing, like when you're in the sphere of calculations, they're opaque. Like even if you know the byte code that's, that the thing compiled to or the source code, in general, the general case, you have to run it to see what it does. Um, there's, um, right, that's, that's what I said here. This is the halting problem. Like, is this going to do what I expect? You got to run it to see. Um, but there's an advantage, which is that they are much easier to manipulate algebraically. So you can start coming up with identities, equalities, um, and move stuff around. Um, in a way that you can't do with the effects because it's all bound up in time. So you can't just like switch the order of two effects. Um, and you can't do like effects lazily, right? Because the first effect might change what the second effect does. So you have to do them in, in the right order. Uh, okay, and so then this is kind of a... A, a monkey wrench in my own thing, or it's a monkey wrench that this lets us talk about, let's put it that way. What counts as an effect? Because any calculation, everything, takes some time, right? It takes, it makes some heat, it uses resources, it uses memory, the stack, the heap, the, the processor is tied up, and so you're affecting the scheduler, which is probably not written in a functional way. Um, you know, your function running at a certain time could cause the GC to pause, and then that causes, you know, and, and so it's not really pure in the mathematical sense. Uh, and, it, and they can all fail. I mean, you could have um, a cosmic ray hit your, you know, and um, uh, we've engineered our computers to not be so sensitive to things and to, you know, we all are, um, we're lucky enough to just like forget that it's like electrons flowing through like pipes that are like nanometers thick, right? And that, that, that at any point like the bus could just like misfire like an electron on the wrong side and like, um, but we have very reliable machines. We don't think about that anymore. Like the punch cards could get jammed. You know, that's what I'm talking about. It happened, but it's, what's that? An actual bug could fly over the hole of your punch card, <laughs> right? Or the vacuum tube. I'm starting to think that, like, we just. Like when you think about math, like it's actually generating heat. <laughs> <laughs> or the chalk dust from mathematicians writing on the board. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think we're talking about, like, the, the reliability. How many nines are we talking about? Um, what, what, what happens if something fails, right? Um, where to draw the line? And so I feel like one of the... One of the design decisions that, let's say, Clojure has made by not having a distinct effect type. They've, you know, we talk about effects, we know what they are, but we trust ourselves to separate out the pure from the impure. As opposed to Haskell, which draws a very strict line about what counts as I.O. and what is not I.O. Um, in Clojure, you can customize it, and there's like unsafe perform I.O., so you can pretend like it's not I.O. And so it's, it's possible, yeah. Um, um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is you could write a file in, on the file system with like a name no one could guess. It's a UUID. No one could ever, and you write to it, and you read from it. Like technically, that's I.O., right? Like if you were to, but come on. Right? It might be okay because no one's going to notice. Right? Um, just like your, your, your process expands its memory a little bit and 
okay, it's fine, you had plenty of memory, nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna go wrong. So would it be like external to the language? So like when you think of like effects, like running out of memory, mm -hmm. something happens, the power cuts out, something like that. So when you express it in data, right, so it comes in and affects things that you don't touch your data. Um, you can draw the line wherever you want, is what I'm saying. It's like, you know, if you are doing a calculation on a spark cluster. Like, you could say, this is a pure calculation. Like, I know all the math that's gonna happen out in the cloud, and then I'll get the answer back. Now the thing is, it could fail, like the cluster could die, get segmented, and um, it's much more likely than if you did it in your memory, right? If you did it on your one CPU. Um, but you could also just, you know, say uh, I'm going to accept that as a as a as a pure function. So because you don't have any control, so when you write your calculation, you're not controlling its runtime such that the runtime underneath it would have the effect, but it's not specified as part of the calculation. So your calculation has some sort of implicit effects, is what that we don't care about. That we that don't care about. care about, right? Well, that that you can you can ignore just like you can ignore friction in physical physics problems, right? You just, ah, we just won't talk about that. I'm saying that you could ignore effects that are actually happening, messages passing around the network. You know, you can move your database from the same server to another server, and now there's like another point of failure that could happen. But you know, we're just saying, ah, it's all the same, right? It's, it's still a pure function <laughs> in that system. Um, but yeah, where to draw the line? I think that's, the, that's the, the choice that we have as functional programmers. It's, it's a lot, this line is a lot fuzzier than, say, functions and data, right? Yeah? One thing I would uh, be interested in, uh, maybe seeing like a distinction made of the effects versus side effects. So when you take, when you take a drug, because that's where the term side effect comes from. I mean, when you take a drug, there's effects, like the ones you want, and then there's side effects, the ones you don't want, right? And I don't think that it's really, I mean, maybe we could call the heat that, that happens a side effect and not an effect. Because effect, we're now defining effect in a very specific way for this theory. And we could say that, you know, this has a side effect of allocating 200 bytes on the stack, you know. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that's true. We're, we're contributing to the heat death of the universe. It's a side effect. No, heat's conserved. Uh, but it's also spreading out <laughs> to be totally even. We don't have... This You're doing all these calculations and you're only going to keep the subset. Right, I see, I see, I see. some effects, right? So you want to make sure that the effects you can't control, you can't control. Could, could, yeah. you, could you make an OS call and lower the frequency of your processor? <laughs> you could do that. I've never built it, right? It's what's exposed in the language. It seems like a lot, though. It's something you can do. Call it a side effect? It's irresponsible. <laughs> I, uh, and, and I think that it is, um, it's one of those, I've actually been called out for saying effect because, because people are then like, oh, but in Java it's a side effect. You know, you would say a side effect. And it's, um, it's, it's not taking I mean, ownership of your actions. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's, it's really hard to calculate how much heat your function is going to cost. <laughs> sure. I, I, just, I think like that Daniel Higginbaum, like your approach with the framework, he makes this distinction. He's like, you know, what effects what is, is necessary 
process, like the process of soft, you know, developing software or like executing software. He's like, but it's the side part that you know. We need to do so what what is his distinction though? I, I can't call it. Mm -hmm. Unintended uh, maybe, or undesired? Maybe it's just like, it's like maybe the effects that can kind of be you know, like some of the space uh, makes things just more difficult to reason about in general. Okay. But yeah, I think he uses, he like, I think he, he uh, structures the contrast by showing like a JavaScript loop and then something in Ruby, and he's like, okay, like these are kind of. These are like what we would have to do, for instance, to uh, mm. you know, do something. It's like, but you know, in closure, we're not even allowed to perform operations. So. I see. I see. Something like if you implement your function, let's say you are implementing a pure function, but you're using a for loop with a bunch of mutation in it. It's all local, so no one else can see how it's done. He was. He would call that a side effect, in, because it's not actually having an effect outside of the function. I think you would maybe a you know, side effect is something that would happen outside, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Again, I think just, maybe if you remember who makes that distinction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, t I'll t check on that. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a good book that he's read. I um I feel like this might be the best definition for side effect. All this stuff that you actually have saying, oh, we're ignoring that. We're ignoring friction. We're ignoring you know air resistance. Um, we're ignoring the time it takes to make the calculation. Um, has anyone written a program that runs some calculation just to uh, just for the time it takes to run? You mean like set time out? No, no. I mean like let me calculate. Let me calculate something for you know like some hard problem. And it does nothing for a while and then stops. Kind of gives you the time. Yeah, like just because, like I, I um, I think I've done this. I mean, not it's I wouldn't recommend it, but like said, like I didn't I didn't know that there was a thread sleep or something. So I'm just like I'm gonna count to a billion or you know something like that. Probably wasn't smart enough to like skip it all. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. We had to print it out too. So, <laughs> um, but that's actually the end of my show. So. I'd love to have any comments, questions. That's the, uh, that's the, the, uh, the ending question. What, so what do you think, let me ask y'all a question. What do you think of this as just a pursuit in general? Does this, is this a valuable pursuit to have a, a theory for why, func what functional programming is? I like how you rename everything so you don't bring all the baggage along, like where you can redefine your own words. Mm -hmm. I should use cause then. So one of the things, the reason I like functional programming so much is that it's just functions and data. So it, it falls in line with that and the effects thing. You're like, you didn't kill it. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and the effects thing is like, I don't know, to me it's a, I guess in the last couple of years, I've been thinking about it more because. I mean, well, Pascal, Pascal has a little while, but I guess I got introduced to like the, uh, the theory of an actual effect as a first class thing with, uh, uh, yeah, I guess with the alpha, like the first thing I saw, I think, you know, like, that's a, that's a good idea to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Haskell um, d does a good job with that too, um, but, but, I mean, the, the thing I would say that it doesn't do a good job with is there's not much you can do with that effect, right? Like you can, you can run it, you can um, compose it with another effect, and then it's kind of like, okay, like, you know, I don't, see peop I don't see many people putting them in a list, right? And then like splitting up the list in half, and then maybe they do that. And yeah, you probably could, yeah. Um, like I don't see list I/O, you know, in in, in uh, many programs. Um, but I feel like in Closure we do do stuff like that. We are passing in around impure functions and putting them in lists, and um, so. Yeah, I mean, the thing about that is I like I like the idea of an effect being called like a trigger. Trigger. Because something occurs. Yeah. It goes off somewhere.
trigger cause. Like it's a synonym for cause. Right. Something different. Right. Right. Called it a reaction. Yeah. I like reaction. But there's action and reaction. Action? Yeah, action. Action's good, I like that. Although it's not the action, it's the, <laughs> it's the thought of the action. But it hasn't happened. It hasn't acted. Not but as the verb, you know, to like affect something into that being. To me, that just have a strong like association with affecting the change. Right, and I think that's where it comes from. Because there's actually two... You know, if you look up effect, um, there's the verb to effect, which means to cause. <laughs> and then there's the effect, which is the result of a cause, which is the noun. Um, oh, you want affects, not effects. No, effect, to affect a change is with an E. Um, that one is the actual cause. <laughs> it means to cause. <laughs> I think so. That it's... <laughs> yeah. Um, actions. I think action is what I'm going to call. It. No. 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 If it was just like get character. But some of them have effects. <laughs> no, they're different. They're. I mean. Sending a message over a wire versus calculating the square root of a number. Like, it's different. Oh, you're to separate I'm tr we want to separate. I mean, that's the whole point.